Um, hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming to our first annual <laughs> meeting here in Laguna Woods. Uh, it's a little different than the theater, but I think this is fun because you actually get a chance to spend time with people and get to know each other and find out what they write, and they get to find out what you write, so it's fun. Um, also, um, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, I don't know who knows Jack Martin in this room, but Jack is seriously ill. He's in Hogue. Um, right now, he somehow managed to contract Legionnaire's disease. Um, yeah, and he is, um, he's having a really, he's having a really, really tough time. So we left his address up in the front. So if you can, if you are so inclined, if you'd like to send him a note of encouragement uh, while he's there, he's going to be there for a while. Um, he doesn't recognize anybody right now. So, uh, but his son asked if, that we do that and give him some support because he's reading these letters to him. So that would be nice. And also, uh, Annie Moose is going to be at Book Carnival today at 2, signing uh, her new book. Hopefully that's not my phone. Um, and if you are just had it, not had enough books today and you want to go to Book Carnival, she's going to be there at 2 o'clock. Okay. Um, so with that, I'm going to try and move the one microphone that we have that works uh, and talk a little bit about our panel today. Uh, we're going to celebrate Halloween with three, uh, the three ladies of horror, fantasy, and um, paranormal. And even, so the latte one, is that, is that the one with the mice, the mouse in it? Yeah, an animal, but we're kind to animals. Uh, so um, I know all three of them very talented. I'm going to give you short bios, and then we're going to talk about um, the much maligned uh, genre of horror and fantasy, and talk a little bit about maybe why it's regaining uh, its glory, and you see it more and more on t in TV and books, uh, and it's maybe horror is becoming a, a bigger part of our lives today. I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> maybe that's it. Um, so with us today, we have um, Dana Hammer. Um, Dana has been a longtime member of SCWA. She's a playwright, screenwriter, short story writer, and novelist. Her screenplay, Red Wings, which um, she'll talk to you about afterwards in, in person, has been optioned by EMA Films, and uh, she has signed a book deal with Cinnabar Moth for her recently released novel, The Cannibal's Guide to Fasting. Uh, she has received over 60 awards and honors for her writing, few of which have generated income, all of which are deeply appreciated. Her works have been and will be published in many anthologies, journals, and magazines. Dana lives in Anaheim with her husband and her child, and she's not a psychopath. <laughs> the jury's still out. Uh, also with us today is Candy Sari. Candy graduated from the University of California at Irvine. Her uh, awards for Black Crow, White Lie include first place in the Dante Rossetti Awards, winner of the Reader's Views Literary Award for the West Pacific, and first runner-up in the Eric Hopper Award for Fiction. She has also been a finalist in the Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award and the William Faulkner Wisdom Creative Writing Competition. Candy's second novel, Magdalena, was released in early July 2023. She lives here in SoCal with her husband and two children. And uh, last but not least is, uh, least is Mary DiStefano. Award-winning author and artist Mary DiStefano has been published by HarperCollins, Entangle Teen, Walter Foster, and Ruby Slippers Press. Born in the Midwest, Former magazine editor Mary DeStefano has released numerous books, including her latest, Lessons in Latte. Her favorite hobbies are reading speculative fiction and watching old Star Trek episodes. Uh, not everybody can do that. Uh, she loves to uh, camp in the mountains, walk on the beach, watch old movies, and listen to alternative music, although rarely at all the same time. Okay, wonderful. We're going to bring everybody up. Let's give our panel a round of applause. As, as I mentioned, whether in film or books or horror, fantasy is often taken a backseat to other genres, um, which when you think about it is surprising uh, in the past and even more so today, because horror has uh, often proven to be a safe place for the exploration of social issues, um, for um, offbeat humor, and for and the examination of humanity and the human condition itself. So we're going to kind of start off a little bit with that discussion um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about what is it about horror or the supernatural. I mean, that's a, that's a hard thing. So when I say horror, I'm including paranormal, I'm including fantasy, 
Uh, so anywhere from zombies to um, uh, wizards to uh, angels, all, all, anything supernatural. Um, so what is it about the genre that kind of hooked you and why do you write what you write? So let's start with Dana. Um, it's always appealed to me. Uh, I think when I was a little girl, me and my mom used to stay up and watch, you know, those really bad B-horror films like, um, El you know, we'd watch Elvira and Couple Night with Gilbert Gottfried and all those. Um, I probably shouldn't have been watching those things at age six or seven, but I loved it. I loved Child's Play. I loved all that stuff. Um, and we would tell each other stories back and forth about this thing we made up called Betsy, the child killing doll. Um, <laughs> So it always, I guess to me, it's never been really a horror thing. It's more been a cozy thing, I guess. Um, I feel I feel at home in the genre, and uh, it's just something that I love, so. So mainly why we write horror, Yeah. Um, if you can hear me, can you hear me? Yes. The thing I love about horror is it's like a slow burn. And it's also, it gives, it, say, it gives itself well to literary writing or beautiful writing. So there's this contrast between this horrible situation, if you look at like Stephen King, a horrible situation in Saving the Plot, but nobody believes it. The main character usually doesn't believe it, doesn't understand it. And as the, as the main character comes to understand it, there's this pulling back of, oh my gosh, this is so darn scary. I don't know if I can do this. And I honestly think the reason I write horror is because I'm scared of everything. I don't even want to drive downtown LA. So it's like, I get so scared of everything and it's an opportunity for me to be in control. But I love the idea that you can write something super beautiful and lure people into your story and scare the crap out of them. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let's see, does this work? Yeah. Okay, I'm sort of the opposite. I don't like scary stories. Um, and I actually write ghost stories because they comfort me. I'm afraid of death, and so in my world, ghosts can be real, and it comforts me believing that, that if I were to lose someone, they could come back to me. So my novel's a bit, you know, there's a creepy vibe, but I think the creepiness is more from the living um, than the actual uh, dead people. So. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm really, I, I read somewhere recently that people love horror movies and, and books because it helps you um, practice um, survival skills. And I just found that kind of fascinating. You might have heard that. But yeah, so I thought, OK, maybe I'll try a scary movie sometime. <laughs> so, so if you ever want to um, learn how to escape a zombie apocalypse, this is the place to be. Um, so, you know, we, so we talked a little bit about um, why you write horror. Talk, uh, from your perspective, talk a little bit about the readers of horror. Um, why you think they read that, or I think even more importantly, what their expectations are, and if they're any different than other genres. I think that horror fans are the best people in the world, 100%. Um, they're open-minded, they're accepting of everybody's quirks and weirdnesses. Um, someone who just spent eight hours reading a book about someone ripping off someone's faces and wearing them isn't going to be weirded out by your little quirk where you have to have your food not touching or whatever. Um, I, every time I go to a horror convention, I love everyone I meet. Um, I, yeah, I can't say enough good things about the horror community. They've always been so welcoming and accepting, and they're the best people. My answer is very similar to what Candy said, and that is that I think people read horror because they want to know that they can survive. And so it, I think it's very important when I'm writing a story that there's resolution. To leave it open-ended where you don't know is this person going to be okay. That's not a good solution for a horror story. Um, let's see. But that said, and I do love the horror community, I love converting people. <laughs> I love convincing people that horror is okay. Mary, Mary, can you hold the mic a little closer? Is it working now? Yeah. Okay. I love um, converting people to horror. I, I, 
my stories don't necessarily start out like horror, but they evolve into it pretty quickly. I'm sorry there is gore. Um, people say that I write scary things, but not spicy things. So <laughs> there's no spice, but there's lots of, you know, action. Um, but, Mary, can I jump in here for a minute? So what do you think uh, horror readers expect of their authors? I mean, when they... I think they want to see a resolution. They want right. to know that the main character is going to survive. If the main character, this is my interpretation, but if the main char character doesn't make it, then they feel they can't make it. I think that's the goal in a horror story. It, it's exactly what you brought up. People read it to know they can make it through it. And that's why there's such a release, why there's such a sense of satisfaction at the end of either a horror story or a horror movie is because you've been like, every muscle's been tense all the way and then at the end you're like, oh, thank goodness. He made it, I'm gonna make it. It's, it's subconscious, you don't even realize you're thinking that, but that is one of the things, it's a kick. You know, it's like, yay, I made it. And you might not even think about it, but um, I try to write maybe, I don't want to say I write horror light because shade is definitely not light. <laughs> but um, there's other things going on in my stories. There's romance usually a little bit. There's um, there's always a goal that the main character is trying to figure out. So there's more than just let's be terrified. But yeah, I think horror is pretty cool. Well, because I don't write really scary horror, just kind of creepy. I think I think. For paranormal, I think what people might be looking for is, you know, I try to write very realistic. I try to make it so that you feel like you're in the real world, but I add touches of the supernatural. And so I think it gives people hope that that we have more, you know, whether we can see ghosts or or someone having the ability to, um, you know, to be a sensitive to see and hear ghosts, just that maybe there's more to life. There's something more magical to us than just our humanity. So I think maybe that's what I hope to um, get it. Um, just kind of to address the expectations of readers, because I don't think I addressed that when I first just said that horror people are awesome. Um, I think that there's, you know, there's different kinds of horror readers, right? There's people who want the splatter punk, they just want lots of blood and guts. And then there's people who want like the cozy ghost stories, and there's people who want the comedy. And um, I think it'd be hard to say that there is uh, one type of horror reader who has an expectation that we can all fill. I think that's why it's important that there be a diversity of writers in the genre, um, because that way we can kind of meet everyone's expectations, because there are many. Yeah. Well, I, I think um, the type of writing that we're talking about is particularly difficult. Um, and you know, we have subgenres that we're talking about, but to get people, all writers have to get people to, fiction writers have to get people to suspend disbelief um, or belief. And um, I, I think that's a, a real challenge when you're talking about creating worlds where, that people have never seen before and um, get, feeling things um, uh, from creatures that they, that they don't understand. So how do you do that? What are some of the things that you do or challenges that you face that you think might be different and how do you deal with those? I have such a bad attitude about that. Um, <laughs> I'm like, if you're not willing to join me on the ride and just suspend your disbelief, whatever I say, you're not going to like my stuff. And um, I know I should probably be a little bit better about that, but for me, um, anytime you're reading something genre that's not grounded in real facts or the real world, um, you really, really need to just be willing to let the author be in control and believe what they're telling you for the, just for the duration of the story. Um, and I think that maybe that could be part of the reason why some people aren't drawn to genre fiction, because they do have a hard time with that. But um, for those of us who enjoy the process of letting go of reality, I think it can be a really rewarding experience. Okay. Ms. Barry, thank you. Um, so what, what kinds of uh, tactics and techniques do you use to help uh, people get into your world and into the state that you want them in, to, to mold them? Let's see, am I close enough to the mic this time? Okay, um, when I look at my different books, and they are all very different, what I do in each one is I build to the trope. 
I build to what the reader of that particular genre is going to expect, and then I may add horror into it. So for instance, Shade is a historical tale based on a meeting of Mary Shelley, Lord Byron, and Percy Shelley in the Swiss Alps when um, Mary wrote Frankenstein and another member of the group wrote the first vampire story. So the trope is historical. Um, so I was the writer of Victorian Homes, or the editor of Victorian Homes Magazine, so I'm very familiar with the time period. So I really built in the time period as many real facts as I could. I also really focused on the emotions that Mary had because she had recently lost a baby, so there was a lot of sorrow she had to deal with. So I wanted to connect with the reader in an emotional way, and also, since it is a historical, with the facts, making them as real as possible. The characters, I did a lot of research on all the characters. But then what happens is, part way into the book, you begin to realize that they're um, in the midst of something called the summer of uh, 18, it was 1816, it was the year with no summer. So around the world, thousands of people died in their beds because it was so cold. So there's this uncharacteristic snow and cold weather, and I had it drive the wild animals down from the mountains. That was just something that I made up, but it fit in with what was really going on. What also happened was the vampires were being driven down from the mountains too, so I focused on local legends, and that was why the first vampire story was written there, was because there were local legends of vampires. So I have the king of the vampires comes down, and then, uh oh, they accidentally create Frankenstein. It sounds far-fetched, but it's a slow burn. Like I said, it's a slow burn, and as you go through it, you're caught up in, that was pretty scary and pretty creepy, but I still want to know what's going to happen. So I like to build to the trope. Valiant is a science fiction. I looked at classic science fictions, which I adore, things like uh, the body snatchers and things like that. I looked at those and built some of those tropes into that story so that readers, if they were familiar with those stories, they would hopefully um, understand what was going to happen. I had aliens invaded very early in the book, and they would get inside a person, much like body snatchers, and that person was gone. So, um, and Fathom is Celtic legends that deal with sulkies and sea monsters. So I try to look at what is there in legends, in myths, and in tropes that will try to draw the reader in, and then it gets scary. Sorry. <laughs> scary. That scared the pants off. All right, how, how about you, Kim? I think what I do is try to make the novel as realistic as possible. I try to really, you know, set the set the scene and 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 give tastes and smells and and you know lots of reality so that as I weave in the supernatural, the reader buys into it because they're immersed in a very real world. Um, so the supernatural is just kind of. Um, you know, a little subtle at first, and then it builds to where you just believe it. Well, I hope. <laughs> um, but yeah, so as much reality as possible, and then the supernatural can feel more real. So we talked about um, the genre in some generality, but there are lots of subgenres. And uh, within the subgenre, every writer has their own style. Um, like Dana deals with a lot of these topics with humor um, and um, her, her own unique author's eye. So, um, and Candy, the same way, and Mary also. Um, and everybody has their, their own style and their own strengths. So I thought it might be interesting to have everybody read a little bit of their, um, their work and also might add to our Halloween atmosphere. So, um, Candy, you wanna start? Sure. Um, you wanna know, tell everybody the name of your book? Here. So my book is Magdalena, um, and I'm reading, um, the first ghost experience. So Magdalena is a, a sensitive. She can see and um, talk with ghosts. She's 15 years old. They live in a small, um, secluded ghost town called Sandstown. And Dottie is her reclusive, odd neighbor um, who no one in town speaks to until Magdalena shows up. I think that's enough background because we're on page 40. OK. In the kitchen, Magdalena turned off the lights and lit candles three on the counter and one on the Ouija board. The girl grabbed her long hair and twisted it round and round until the great mass was piled into a bun atop her head. Somehow she tucked in the ends so that they stayed in place. It looked like a bird's nest, 
one a Greek priestess might wear. The young priestess turned to the cutting board and cut one of the lemons I'd pulled from the tree, holding half, by the way, lemons conjure the ghost. That was the other thing you needed to know. Holding half in each hand, she walked to the table and opened her arms. Lifting her chin, eyes toward the ceiling, she called out, Benjamin, we invite you in. She squeezed the lemon. A touch of juice sprayed out while the rest dripped through her fingers onto my floor. I briefly considered grabbing a wet towel to wipe it up, but I resisted and forced myself back into the moment. The kitchen was silent, but for the refrigerator's soft hum, through the flickering candlelight, I watched the lemon juice continue to drip onto the linoleum. A chill began to overtake the room, and as I wrapped my arms around myself, a rush of air grazed me as if someone had walked by. Magdalena followed with her eyes. My heart sped up. Benjamin had been visiting me each day, but this time we were joined by a real sensitive. I backed to the counter and held on to the pink tiles for support. Do you see him? I whispered. Yes, she whispered back with a calm of one who had seen enough ghosts not to be afraid anymore. The air was chilly and still. Magdalena pointed to a drawer and gave a slight nod. It slowly opened. Once it had opened all the way, she nodded again and it slammed shut. I gasped at the sudden sound, slapping my hand over my mouth. The girl gave that half smile and then moved to the window over the sink. She pointed to the lever that controlled the glass louvers and nodded again. Slowly, the lever turned by itself and the panel separated, opening the window. Cool ocean air blew into the kitchen along with a faint sound of the bell buoy. With another nod, the lever traveled the opposite way until the window closed. She nodded toward the sink and the water turned on. The same command turned it off. Up on her toes, she spun around, her plaid skirt widening like a parasol, and the back door behind us slammed shut. I jumped. I hadn't realized it was open. Don't worry, she whispered. I told him to. I wasn't actually worried, just surprised. I knew Benjamin was too kind to cause any harm. Fear was not the emotion I felt there in my kitchen. I was in awe. In a town, overwhelmed by the mysteries of our lingering dead, here was a girl who understood them. Start over. I'm going to be talking about Fathom. It's a book that deals with Celtic legends. They're real. And um, sulkies and sea monsters and a young girl who's coming of age. The main character's name is Kira. I never believed in ghosts until I saw one face to face when I was 12. It was the middle of the summer, one of those nights when the wind scratched tree branches against my window and the Pacific roared so loud I thought it was going to sweep me away. Something startled me awake, some shifting of our house, beam against beam, old wood crying out in the damp sea breeze. Almost instantly, a chill shiver ran down my arms. I got out of bed, the wooden floor cool and welcome against my bare feet. I paused in the hall hallway, noticed the fragrance of freshly cut hawthorn in the air. I used to love that smell, not anymore. Then I saw something in a pool of moonlight, spots of water on the floor, like tiny lakes, each one perfectly formed and separate, watery footprints leading toward my father's door. I couldn't breathe or move. Part of me wanted to disappear. Another part of me hoped that maybe the past could be erased and rewritten. That was when I saw her, my mother. I have her photo on my nightstand, me, my sister, and her, all in a huddle of green leaves, her dark hair twined with Katie's and my own, like the three of us were one person. We were up in our treehouse. My father must have taken that picture, and here she was right in front of me, tall and slender and silver in the pale moonlight, her long dark hair swirling in the muggy summer breeze, looking like a mermaid, her skin glistening, as if she had just rised from her briny home. Dark lips parted, and a small gasp came out when she saw me. 
It only lasted a moment, but in that moment of time, I saw too much. Her fingers stained with fresh blood. Her eyes the color of the ocean. Her skin so pale. It looked as if she hadn't seen the sun in years. Mom? A whisper cry came from her lips. She came nearer then, this wraith from the past, until she could press a slender, a slender finger against my lips. She shook her head. We both knew the rules. I grew up on the Celtic legends. They were all my family talked about during the long winter nights when the fire crackled and spit and our bellies were full. But for now, silence filled the hallway, long enough for me to hear the air coming in and out of my mother's mouth as if she had run a great distance to get here. Perhaps the gates to the underworld were farther away than I thought, or perhaps she had climbed the great cliff our house sat upon, all the way up from the ocean floor to get here. Finally, when neither of us could bear the quiet any longer, and I'm sure both of us would have started weeping, when words would have gushed like streams from our mouths, and we would have broken every rule that protected the living from the dead. At that point, she brushed past me, down the hallway toward the back door. I turned and watched her run across the yard through the thicket of trees and overgrown thorny bushes toward the cliff, the same path she took seven years ago. The night she killed my sister and threw and then threw her tiny body in the ocean. The very same night that my mother killed herself. And now for a little change of pace, Miss Dana. So I'm going to be reading from The Cannibal's Guide to Fasting. <laughs> Horror comedy about... Uh, a world where there's viral cannibalism. My main character is Igor. He's, I, I'll just read it. <laughs> Chapter one. Igor is a huge, scary looking man. Standing six feet, seven inches tall, encased in bulges of muscle, he attracts attention everywhere he goes. Ropey veins snake beneath his taut, tan skin. A spider web sprawls across the left side of his face, a tattoo choice that has not endeared him to potential employers or dates, and one that he regrets deeply. He is not the type of man who one can ignore. He is also not the type of man who one confronts about the breaking the park, no picking wildflowers policy. He carries an old fashioned woven basket, which is filled with bluebells, daisies, and a few shy violets he managed to find hiding behind a rotten stump. He picks wildflowers regularly. It is zen as fuck. There was a time, not so long ago, when he would have mocked such a pursuit. There was a time when he turned up his nose at botanists, botany, and plant based careers in general. He thought of them as glorified gardeners, hobbyists puttering away in the dirt. Those days are long gone now. He gasps and slaps at a mosquito that tastes his neck. He always kills mosquitoes if he can. He knows that his virus can't be transmitted via mosquito bite, but the thought makes him panic all the same. Too many rumors and fake news articles have done their damage, and he can no longer be bitten without fear. That's why he has covered himself in long sleeve t-shirt and pants, despite the hot day. He doesn't want to risk it. Infecting another person is his worst nightmare. It's been six months since he was released from the rehab center that purported to cure him of the urge to eat human flesh. The program itself was lengthy and long on religion, but since his graduation, he has managed to stick to a socially acceptable diet, and so, he supposes, the program was a success. He stuck with it and kept himself out of trouble. That's more than many of his friends can say. It's getting too hot. He needs to get his flowers home and get them pressed between the pages of the Encyclopedia Britannica he purchased from a garage sale a few weeks ago. After they are pressed, he will categorize them, label them, and add them to his growing collection of pink, glittery scrapbooks. Igor does not understand why all scrapbooks are designed for basic 11-year-old girls. He also needs to tend to his vegetable garden. In this heat, the plants will dry out and die, and then where will he be? It's hard to get fresh, good-tasting produce nowadays, so he has to grow it himself. It's either that or given to temptation and eat the stuff he really wants to eat. A family on a nature hike stares at Igor. He's sure it's not often they see a man like him, especially not out here, especially not with a basket of flowers, but their rudeness irritates him all the same. Igor glares at them. You got eye problems? The parents put protective hands on their children's shoulders and scoot them away from the dangerous man. Igor rolls his eyes. Douchebags, he mutters as he walks past them. He is tired of being stared at, tired of being an outcast. He is tired of everything. Uh, 
I don't know about you guys, I'm exhausted. Uh, but, but you can really see the, the differences that, that we've, um, and thank you guys for showcasing that today. Um, the different approaches and the different styles of writing um, that we have up here. So I'm, I'm just curious, um, of the elements of writing, and I had to write them down so I didn't forget anything. <laughs> Story, conflict, character, world building. What do you think is the most important um, element in, uh, of those in your writing, and which is the most difficult to do, for you to address? Uh, for me, character is the most important. Um, I'll read a book about someone finding a penny on the ground if it's a really interesting person doing it. Um, as far as, what were the, what were the things? Uh, character, <laughs> conflict, story, world building. I guess probably world building's the most difficult just because it takes a lot of effort and thought and um, attention to detail. And attention to detail is really my strong suit. But I like doing all of them, so hopefully I manage to succeed at them. <laughs> A quick question. A follow-up question. Now. Do you think your screenwriting, um, the fact that you're a screenwriter as well as a novelist, impacts how you write? I think so. Um, it's just kind of a different way of thinking about it. Like when you're writing a novel, you can really get into the interiority of someone's thoughts, um, how they are inside. And when you're writing a screenplay, you can't do that. Everything has to be able to be conveyed visually. So. Um, I think it helps keep your brain limber to switch back and forth between the two. Um, yeah, I would say it affects it. Sometimes when I'm writing a, a short story or a novel, I'll say, oh, what would this look like on the screen? Or when I'm like writing a, a screenplay, I have to figure out how to um, portray something without, without that uh, interiority. So, yeah. How about you, Mary? I'm going to repeat this. Okay, so of the following elements, um, which do you think is most important for you, and which is the most challenging? Story, conflict, character, or world building? I'm going to cheat because that's the kind of person I am. Okay. Uh oh, here we go. <laughs> Definitely most important for me is character. If I don't have my character in place, if I can't understand what they're afraid of, if they won't talk to me, and let me tell you, sometimes they don't talk to me and I have to trick them into telling me their secrets and then I tell the world and then they hate me. But, um, so, character. And I, they become so real, I have a hard time getting their voices out of my head after I'm done. I'm like, go away, character, I love you, I'm done. Um, so character is definitely the most important for me. I can't write without it. But that said, the other elements aren't my problem. The, the element that is my problem is plot. I am not a plotter by nature. I only plot when I have to. Um, I don't feel that story and plot are the same. They're a little bit different. Um, so I, I am what is known as a discovery writer. Some people call us pantsers. I mean, don't we all wear pants? So I don't know why they call us that. But discovery writer, because if I, if I over plot, meaning I put together a dang outline, if I put together an outline, I don't want to write the story because I'm done. So I will do like a plot point outline where these things are gonna happen in my story. And really what I'm looking at is what are the secrets and when am, I, when am I going to reveal them? And the funny thing is, which drove one of my editors at Entangled Nuts, is I put together my plot point outline, but I don't really know what order those things are going to be revealed. So I, removed, I moved them around. That's how I solve my problem of plotting gives me a panic attack. So. <laughs> was there another question too? No, okay. I'm with the two of you. Character is everything because, and, and plotting would be my, my um, difficulty because I need so much time to get to know the character, to know what they're going to do. I feel like if I were given a plot and I just plugged characters in, it would feel so unrealistic. I'm forcing them to do something so psychological. I think it takes me years to just get to know a character. So um, it takes me several years to write because I spend so much time and lots of writing that gets deleted because it's not realistic. So um, the plotting is challenging, but if I give it enough time, I get to it just because I get to know the characters and they let me know what they're going to do. And I'm convinced that writer's block is when you try to force your character into something. It just doesn't make sense. And so I just have to let go and say, okay, do something different, you know, and then give that a try. Okay, um, so in, in a brief answer, 
Um, what do you think is your trademark? I mean, if someone said, okay, um, Dana, this, I, can I read this and know that this is a Dana Hammer uh, production? What, what do you think your trademark is? What makes you different from other writers? I don't know that I have a trademark. I think I do have a unique voice. Um, I think that typically people do recognize my writing um, when they encounter it. I've had people tell me that they can hear me reading it in my voice. So, um, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't think I have a great answer for that. Sorry. Voice, voice is trademark. So okay. My voice. Okay. All right. How about you, Mary? Um, I write dark, magical stories with a thread of hope. This is a great question. Um, I guess I write very odd things. I write um, very odd and unexpected because I don't know where the story's going, so there's always just such, it, it's strange and odd and, and you know, somewhat magical and, and hopeful. There's always hope at the end. All right, All right. so um, I would love to keep talking to you guys, but um, I know people are getting hungry. So um, I'm gonna ask you if, um, you have, if we have people out in the audience who are either writing horror, fantasy, or paranormal, or who are tempted to write it, what would your advice be to them? Um, well, let's start. Let's check that. Candy, what do you think? Write what you're curious about. I think curiosity is everything because curiosity will keep taking you into into you know um, the topic and. If you're curious about it, I think you'll get your your um, readers to find that because it's something interesting to you, and you'll continue on with it, and you'll stay faithful to it because it speaks to you. Okay. Um, first, I would say, only write a genre if you think you really love it. That's I, I don't believe in writing to market. I think that will kill your heart and your soul. So um, select a genre because you like it you're interested, you're intrigued by it, and then read some books that are written in that genre. I, I'm a person that I believe in intuitive learning. I, I, even though I have some books on writing that I've written, um, that made no sense. But um, even though I do teach writing and things like that, I also believe that the best way to learn how to write is to read. And if you have trouble reading, because some of us do, my vision's not great, then immerse yourself in movie and film, because you're a screenwriter and you know. You learn a lot from film, so I love screenwriting. Um, immerse yourself in the genre that you're interested in, and don't let one person in the world tell you you can't do it. I don't care how old you are. I don't care if you've been writing children's books. I don't care. I don't care, because there's nothing you can't do if you don't if you want to do it. And your first draft might not be great because none of them are, and that's okay. So just if you want to do it, do it, but study the genre a little bit first. Um, I would say don't be afraid to write something that's absurd, and don't be afraid to write something that's bad. Um, even if it is bad, if you keep writing it, it'll stop being bad. So um, I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of writers, are really uh, perfectionists at heart, and they want everything they write to be genius and they want it all to be wonderful and realistically no matter how good of a writer you are you're going to write some crap at some point so just embrace it um if you really want to write something that's you know horror and sci-fi or something and you've never done that before just give it a try worst case scenario it sucks right uh you're only out a little bit of time so yeah okay all right so does anybody have um, questions for our panel uh let's start with nana I hope it's a simple question, but I wrote a novel that has a ghost in it. It's not a ghost story. In my vision of the story, the ghost is just there in the house, and the characters are doing their own life, and the ghost is kind of going along. I've had a number of people complain that my ghost is not scary enough, or not there enough, and you should bring them in earlier. But to me, I tell them it's, it's a, not a ghost story, it's a story with a ghost. So I, I can't decide whether I want to take the ghost out because it's too no, distracting. No, don't. I think that's freaking delightful. I don't know if any of you guys watch a, a Big Mouth, the TV show. It's like an animated series, but like it's not at all a ghost story. But there's just like the ghost of Duke Ellington lives in one of the kids' attics. 
and he sometimes just gives the kids advice and you know I, I think that's delightful and fantastic and you should not take the ghost out and you should find readers who are more open-minded and if it speaks to you yeah, if you feel the ghost is important, keep it in. I went to a book club where they said that this does, this feels like a novel with a ghost in it, exactly what you said, but they found that kind of interesting. So there's a whole lot of readers. It's so hard to stick into a specific genre, so it yeah, just do what feels right. And my story might sound like a ghost story, but there's no ghost in it. So, you know, there are no rules. And I like what you described. I, I don't know how um, how much your ghost has to play in, in the story, but if he's a natural character, he's just a character in your book. You know, say so this is I've got a ghost for a character and a cat for a character, and I've got kind of just kind of like a witch. You know, you might have a bunch of people that fall into categories, and you could say, you know, and that could be part of how you promote your book. When is it finished? Okay. That's how you, that could be how you promote your book when you're done. It's a ghost story, but it's not about the ghost, you know, or it's a book with the ghost and he's not the main character. You know, you can promote it, you can put a, a hook on it and write like 20 different hooks. I really think one of the best ways to find a heart of your story is to write a blurb or to write a hook and log line, right? <laughs> I love log yeah. lines. So um, write a, you know, 100 word, 25 or you know synopsis of your story read it over and over until you find one that really fits and then say do I need to tweak my story to fit my blurb because sometimes that's the way writers do it you write the book then you write the blurb again and then you tweak it so thank you anybody else Sorry. with so much um, that has been done on screen on books everywhere with horror with mystery with, how do you create suspense and shock that sometimes will be, you know, different or actually keep you interested to be go ah like that. I think for me, I again, I don't, I don't plan ahead, and so I sort of keep going with it until something happens and they shock me. I sort of let the characters do that for me, and if they do it to me, hopefully the reader will get that feel. So I didn't build up, you know, just artificially. That makes sense. It almost sounds to me like you're talking about a plot twist versus a shock element. I'm not sure, but you do have to build up to that. You do have to um, foreshadow it so that people don't go, I don't believe it. So if it's a plot twist, and I love plot twists in my books, I love to surprise my readers. So if it's a plot twist, just foreshadow it. And as Carrie, as Candy said, it's your character's responsibility to reveal it to the reader. Don't get in the way of the character, but foreshadow it. Um, I don't know that I necessarily try to shock and surprise. Um, I think that uh, I try to entertain and I write what I enjoy reading. And if that does shock some people, I think I don't know that that's necessarily a good thing, but I hope that people enjoy the shock if they are shocked. Um, but it's not my goal to shock. Um, I have a question. So, so if you're talking to a group of writers that don't necessarily write in your um, genre, um, but are, if like Nanette said, including elements of, of um, horror or uh, paranormal, what do you think are the biggest traps um, that uh, people fall into, and how can they avoid that? I would say um, allowing too many cooks in the kitchen. Uh, I think that critique groups can be very useful, and beta readers can be very useful. But um, if you try and take everyone's advice into account, you're going to wind up with some kind of Franken book that no one wants to read. So I would say, um, you know, listen to people. if. If everyone is giving you the same feedback that this one thing isn't working, take that seriously. But if just one person saying this thing, another person saying another thing, and everyone's telling you different things, just go with your gut and stick with uh, what makes sense for you and your voice and your vision of what the story is going to be. I would say listening to too many other people is uh, the big bad trap. 
I agree with not listening to too many people, but it's so important to listen to those you trust. Because oftentimes, you know, especially with a, a first draft, that's, you know, it, it makes sense to me, but then when someone else reads it, when they tell me what doesn't make sense, I have to stay very open. And I always go to people I really trust and, and listen to that to make those changes because you don't want the end product to be something that doesn't make sense to anyone. What, what, um, if, if you have writers who write in other genres who want to include elements of paranormal or whatever into into their story, what, would, what do you think the trap is and what advice would you give them on how to do a lot of this? Um, if they haven't written it before, I would say the trap would be to do it poorly. <laughs> but we've already said that's okay, right? We've already said it's okay to do something that's not beautiful or perfect the first time. So you might write it poorly the first time. But I honestly believe that the genius in writing is in the editing. You know, I, I might act like it's in the writing, but it's not, it's the editing. And um, James Scott Bell has a wonderful book, which I don't remember the name of, and don't throw any stones, but he suggests, you know, you give yourself a little bit of space after you finish the book, or even you've got five chapters done. So, this is how I follow his advice. I print out my five chapters or whatever I'm looking at. I go to my car because it's my closet. No one can call me, you know, I don't bring my cell phone. No one can call me, no one can, can bother me, and I always park someplace where I can get food if I need to or I can use a restroom. So I'm completely like comfy in my car, and I sit there and I have a red pen and I go through it and I mark me as a reader. I have to be a reader. Did I lose interest? That gets a certain mark. Am I confused? That gets another mark. Um, this doesn't make sense, or this, I lost interest, it doesn't fit. Those are really three things that will strengthen your work no matter what you're writing. So if you get confused, you lose interest in your own story, um, and it needs more explanation. There are a few more things you look for too, but a lot of it is pacing, a lot of it is you put an extra two paragraphs in there that were beautifully written, but they don't have anything to do with the story. So you have to read it like a, a, a reader, and if it, if it sings to you once you've edited it, I don't think it matters what genre you're writing. Honestly, you may have set out to write paranormal, but if after you've gone through and you've edited it well, it turns out to be another type of story, that's okay. It, don't judge yourself for, no, don't judge yourself too harshly, okay? Keep writing. Last, lastly, um, what do you hope that people feel or think when they finish reading one of your books? Uh, I hope that they want to uh, give me money and buy more of my books. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the practical approach to art. <laughs> I like to create a story, I guess I would describe it as not completely 100% written. So I leave you with the opportunity to see the next chapter in your mind. I want the characters to live with you and for you to wonder, oh, I wonder what's gonna happen next. I wanna know, I'm gonna make that ending in my mind. I really hate it when I see a movie and they go too far and they destroy everything I had hoped for that character. I like to leave it in a place where you aren't completely sure but you have hope that something wonderful, even more wonderful is gonna happen. I like to give the reader an experience. I mean, I hope the reader takes away an experience and really immerses themselves into something different and finds um, strange characters that they can that they can actually like by the end. Um, even the outcast, you know, maybe have a little more compassion and understanding toward an outcast. Um, and and yeah, just pick up what you need from there. You know, leave a little open door for readers and and hope. <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, thank you. If there are no more questions, we're going to um, turn. Yeah, Larry? Were you, were you raising your hand or were you just getting up to? Well, I had one. The genre is very um, expansive wide. It has so many different, there's no parameters to it. But what is the key thing that attracts you to that, to this genre? Why, you know, not. Um, I think I kind of said before, for me, it's it's believing in something more. I sort of look for magic in my life, 
You know, I, I think I've had um, maybe messages from people who have passed and, you know, it may be my imagination, but I sort of like to play with that and sort of, um, um, I just create a world where that is real instead of just me imagining it. So I, I like that, that feel. You probably aren't going to like my answer, but I never set out to write horror. It just happens. <laughs> See, yeah, my, my stories get scarier and scarier, and I'm like, scary book, okay, it's okay, scary book. I like things that are unusual and odd and things that transcend the mundane, and um, that's just what keeps me coming back to the genre. And I like other genres too. I like a good chick lit. I like a good nonfiction book about salt or whatever. But um, yeah, I think that you know horror is my home. I like creepiness and I like crafting creepiness. And um, yeah, I like the unexplained. And I think that a lot of people just really need that in their lives. Something that's a little, a little off the beaten path. All right. Okay. So, yeah. I have one more question. Are any of you working on a plot with AI involved with the supernatural? Yeah. I did. I did mention it to you. I think um, I was a third of the way through an apocalyptic novel that dealt with AI taking over the entire world, and COVID hit, and so many things in my story were like what was going on in the world that I couldn't write. I felt like, I'm writing the end of the world, I have to stop. So yes, I do have one, but it's not finished. Okay. All right, okay. So what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna break for lunch. Um, our panel is gonna stay with us, so you'll get a chance to um, talk to them, and hopefully they, they brought books. Uh, we, we will be selling and signing. Um, so hopefully if you can, if you could support them, that would be great.